And we're live. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the HR Leaders Podcast. On today's show, super excited for this. I'm joined by my good friend, Dave Oric, who's a best-selling author, professor, thought partner on HR, and co-founder and principal at the RBL Group and RBL.ai. Welcome back to the show, Dave. How are you? Chris, what a delight. It's such an honor to join you. I uh, follow you regularly, and I encourage people I work with to follow you regularly. So thank you so much. Right back at you, Dave. Can you believe it's been five years since our last podcast? I can't believe it. And and nothing. Well, as I said in the pre-talk, I must not be loved. I must not be liked. And <laughs> and, and there's not much been going on in the last five years. So uh... no, well, we've seen you many times, Dave. As our audience knows, at our events and the summits and the and the panels and, and stuff like that. It just kind of t- threw me back a second when I looked on YouTube and saw our conversation. And uh, that was kind of when we were still in my bedroom. Kind of me and Shane trying to figure out. No, 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 no. You've got you've got to explain that. <laughs> Talking about you and I in your <laughs> that that deserves a little well, more explanation. Yeah, well, the podcast started in my spare room before Robin even came to this world. My daughter and uh, Dave, you were one of the people kind enough to say yes to who's this crazy person asking me to come on their show, and you were kind enough to say yes, which I appreciate you. And uh, and here we are. We've come a long way. The world's shifted and changed dramatically. HR has changed dramatically in the last five years. Um, but anyway, first of all, how are you and how are the family? Great question. We're doing well. Um, the last two years have been demanding for all of us. We're lucky enough, my wife, Wendy, and I, and her picture, uh, we don't have ch- children at home. I know with Robin, that you and Natasha, that's got to be tough, but we're well physically, emotionally, socially. Um, we're doing nice. well. And I know you've gone through some ups and downs, and uh, I hope you're also doing well overall. That's critical. Uh, I appreciate you. Um, how have the, are you back on the road now, right? How's that been? Uh, starting to, I'm not sure. I'll be really honest. I in, I have five, five weeks with five trips. So the next five weeks I'm out of town every week, not as much as I was. And I think some of that's good and some of it's bad. I've done a whole, whole lot of horde, a lot of webinars. I think it's over <laughs> 400 at this point. Yeah. And um, sometimes they work. I can feel a connection with you. Uh, I hope you get, What's fun is you get to peek into my office. You get to see a little bit about where I live and what I'm about. And I know you have a backdrop today, but I often get to peek into your studio and your office. So some of that's good, but I love in person. I just did a two day in person session uh, with a small group of people. And it was just so nice to feel the emotional connection. So we're seeing, I think, this hybrid work. I don't know how it's going to work. I think we're all discovering it. Yeah. I've been to one of your workshops before in London, Dave, and I just, I don't think you can recreate that virtually. You just can't, you know. Not as well. Uh, Not as well. I just did a session for 45 minutes where I basically talked and I think, uh, are you awake? And and the fact is almost everybody's (laughs) multitasking as they may be right now, but I love the personal connection. I I love to feel that and to sense that, but we're, we're seeing a different world that we live in. One of the things that I've been really cool to watch, Dave, is your evolution of online, your online presence. I was yeah. always someone that said to you before, Dave, we need to get you more on social media, get more articles. And now you're like, I don't know where, how you keep it up, but you're just always, you're always constantly coming out with new articles. And, you know, I, <laughs> I decided just at a personal level, I've written a lot of books and uh, a book takes about a year to write, about a year to get published. And then it takes six months to get distributed. That's two and a half years <laughs> other than our five year hiatus. And so I decided a couple of years ago, I want quick response. And so I post every Tuesday on LinkedIn. And um, and by the way, that's become a challenge. What do you post I that's bet. new every single week? And then I make comments. I have found in the in the world we live in today that when you when you're face to face, you have lunch, you have social time, you hear things. We don't get that. LinkedIn is my water cooler. And I love comments on LinkedIn. And somebody said, Dave, how many staff do you have responding to all those comments? And I said, it's me. Every comment I make, it's got typos. It's got bad spelling. (laughs) But I use LinkedIn as my water cooler. Um, And I'm getting great stuff. And what I love about LinkedIn is it's a global world. Mm. I I never look at who the author is because I don't care about title. I care about ideas. And by the way, somebody could have a very famous title and they don't have very good ideas. Others, I have no clue who they are, or where they are, but they have great ideas. And so I'm finding that I really relish um, ideas. I've said to Wendy, my wife, ideas are my best friends. And she said, I thought I was. Uh, and I said, <laughs> hey, you're a close second. But um, I think LinkedIn is a great post. I hope people will follow. 
yeah. um, not to waste time, but to use time to learn. And yeah. I know you're, you're active, Chris, in all social media. You're really yeah. aggressive. So. Anyone who knows you, Dave, knows that you're a pro prolific note taker. And you've kind of translated that on, online because I noticed at the end of all of your content, and we'll get into some of that now, you always ask the audience, add your two cents. I want to hear what, like, you know, even this, in what we're going to talk about today, the 10 ideas that are shaping the future human capability, you end it by saying, what would you add? And honestly, some of the comments were super fascinating. I actually yeah. read them myself and I was like, wow. So th the learning continues um, as well. Let's hope. Let's hope. Yeah. And, and by the way, Chris, you, you're iconic at that. I think your episodes, your speakers, always curious about what's next. Let's not recreate the past. That's why I love the idea that we're going to get into evolution. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of evolution because evolution means you build on the past. You don't you don't uncreate it. You don't you don't ignore it. But you say what's been done is great. Now let's move to the next step. And yeah. that's the logic of evolution. Well, let's jump into some of these ideas. Um, I think you started with number one, which was think outside in. Many people heard you say that before. Um, but what I thought was really interesting is when you said context is the kingdom and content is the king. Can you elaborate on that for everyone listening? You bet. You bet. So I say to an HR person, they come to a program at Michigan or elsewhere, and they say, what do you want to learn today? Or what have you learned in this program? Or Chris, one of your programs. I've learned about how to manage talent mobility, whatever you call it, quiet quitting, great resignation. I've learned how to manage culture. I've learned how to build leadership. Great. By the way, at Michigan, we teach a program. Somebody said, I'm going to go home and manage culture, leadership, DEI. And I said, we have failed you. Like, what do you mean you failed me? Put behind what you said so that. I want to manage culture so that. I want to manage leadership so that. And the so that should eventually lead to value in the marketplace. If you're not creating value in the marketplace, there won't be a workplace. I believe that so strongly. That's the evolution. Uh, quick, quick anecdote. Last May, I did a talk to 100 senior executives in a huge company. I don't need to name the company. And they said, tell me about yourself. And I said, what do these companies have in common? Digital equipment, Compaq, Toys R Us, Enron, Eastman Kodak. And somebody yelled out, they've all failed. And I yelled out, I consulted for all of them. <laughs> By the way, that's not a great way to win respect. And they said, should we listen to you? And I said, I hope I've learned from those. All of those companies had great HR practices, phenomenal for their day, but they were inside out. They weren't connecting them. Toys R Us did a great job, but they missed the external world of Amazon where people could buy toys. If you don't succeed in the marketplace, there is no workplace. HR is not about HR. It's about creating value in the marketplace by asking so that. I want to do culture so that we succeed in the marketplace. Our culture is not what we do. It's what our customer gets from what we do. I want to build leadership so that we succeed in the marketplace. I could keep going. That metaphor for me, Chris, is just compelling because it gets HR out of HR. It gets HR into the business. You've been saying this for so long, Dave. Do you feel like we've made significant strides in doing this? Not enough. I still love to ask HR people, what's the biggest challenge in your job today? Hiring people, training people, hybrid work. Ah, what's the biggest challenge in my job today? Helping my company succeed with customers. Mm. We're not there yet. It's, by the way, it's a mindset. It's, it's, a, it's a mental model that I think we've got. I say it now. Oh, well, yeah, that's true. So last time you, you, you built a confidence model to hire people, reskilling the new trend. Did you include customers? No, I didn't do that. Oh, well, then what are you doing reskilling for? If it's not to get <laughs> customers to buy your product, why are you doing it? Last time you ran a leadership training program. Yeah. Did you include customers? Uh, not really. Then why did you do the training if your leadership didn't build value? Anyway, are we getting there? Not enough. I mean, we need people like you to continue to broadcast this to, to get the message out. And it's yeah. not a complicated message. No. I love the two words so that. Think about your last three episodes, Chris. Mm -hmm. I want to do diversity. I want to do hybrid work so that absent the so that it becomes an internal navel gazing activity. Yeah, I've actually you've said that before and I've used that even internally in our organization. And it really sparks a really interesting debate. And a lot of times we're like, actually, let's not do that. <laughs> because it doesn't make sense uh, when you add so that on the end. And and that was number two, really, what you kind of just explained, to add value to others. HR isn't about HR, it's about creating value for all stakeholders. 
Yeah. Um, who are the other stakeholders that we need to be thinking about? No question. You got inside the company, you got employees. If we're not creating value for the employees, their experience, their, their, their affect, we're in trouble. Inside the company, it's obviously for the strategy of the company. Can we help make strategy happen? Outside, it's customers, investors, communities, regulators, that whole portfolio of stakeholders. One of the coolest things we've seen and uh, is in the United States, and I don't know if Britain has done the same, and other countries soon will, government regulators require reporting. The Securities Exchange Commission reports how you're doing. In the 1930s, 100 years ago, they came up with FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board. You report your financial results. In 2021, U.S. companies, 7,000 of them, had to report human capital. So we had 7,000 companies reporting human capital with no guidance. And I'm, I get so excited about this, Chris. This is the framework that's changed my world in the last 18 months. We started to look at what they did. And it was there's a very nice four-letter word that describes it. And it's not going to be the one you're thinking. Junk. J-U-N-K. It was random. People didn't know what to report in human capital. Some reported diversity ratios. Some reported CEO pay ratios. Some reported days of training. There was no theory. There was no logic. We've come up with a point of view that's really strong. HR today needs an integrated framework. We have piecemeal. Look at your last 20 programs. They're talking about resignation, leadership, employee primacy, skill building. We believe there is a framework and we call it human capability. And here it goes. Human is people. That's my fingers. That's the talent, human capital, anything related to people. Organization capability is my fist. Anything related to the workplace, the team, the culture. You've got to manage your people. You've got to manage your organization. The combination is leadership. My forearms represent HR. Those are the services that drive talent, organization, and leadership. So human capability is talent, organization, and leadership. And my forearms represent HR. Okay, Chris, I'm going to have you do this. I've done it in webinars. I'm going to look stupid. Put up your fingers, that's your talent. Put up your fists, that's your organization. That's your leadership. That's your HR services. And then you do a dance. By the <laughs> way, if Robin and Natasha are around, we'd have them do the dance. They'd do it much better than you. By the way, I make myself look so stupid with that. No, but I love it. I like. <laughs> but that's the agenda. Yeah. Now, what did we do? We worked with Amazon as an AI provider Mm -hmm. We tracked 7,000 companies using machine learning. How well did they report talent, organization, leadership, and HR? We got a score for 7,000 companies. Then we correlated it. We did statistics on employee productivity, financial results, short-term and long-term, social responsibility results. Our results in that research are double anything that we've ever done with surveys. Stop and think what I just said. We can now tell you how much your talent, organization, leadership, and HR drives employee productivity, cash flow, intangible value, and social citizenship. That framework is valid. That for me, Chris, is fundamentally changing. When an HR person who's listening to this says, oh, I'm going to go to my business team and I'm going to talk about great resignation. Super. That's a piece of talent. I'm going to talk about hiring people or job skills. That's a piece of talent. I'm going to talk about culture. That's a piece of organization, hybrid. I'm going to talk about new leadership skills. That's leadership or HR systems. Now I've got a framework that is empirically valid and practically relevant. Do we have the right talent, organization, leadership, and HR services to deliver value? Mm -hmm. I think that moves our field to a profound movement. Yeah. Because all of the evolutions we talk about are either in talent, organization, leadership, or HR. And we then have a science as well as an innovation framework. We're pushing that pretty hard. Human is talent. Capability is organization, leadership. And we're moving forward. Okay, I get carried away. That research we've just done, we're just <laughs> starting to report it. We've been, been under a pretty strong NDA. It's really powerful. It's very powerful because it tells me as an HR person, do we have the right people, organization, leadership, and HR? Okay. Amazing. And this is the organizational guidance system, right? It's the next step. The guidance system we did with surveys. Okay. And we got about 1,000 companies to give us guidance. Mm -hmm. Now we're doing it with machine learning on 7,000 companies. 
And that's over at RB Older AI, right? Uh, it's a new firm. It's called, uh, uh, by the way, you, you we invent and we reinvent. It's called okay. G3 Governance and Guidance for Growth okay. Human Capability, G3HC. I'm glad and I asked. We're, and we're going to have the website up. Uh, I saw the first draft of it yesterday. Yeah. G3HC, Governance and Guidance for Growth Through Human Capability. Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. But that's an exclusive here. <laughs> that is an exclusive. I just announced it. The, the website is not done yet, and it's not going to be beautiful. It's going to be, a, by the way, this is all a work in progress. But 100%. I just feel like in HR, we get so many. We went, I don't know if you've been with your, your wife and, and beautiful daughter to Disney. We saw the Star Wars exhibit. You get in the little machine, and all mm-hmm. the things are coming at you, a video game. That's what I feel like HR is right now. We're getting, you know, hybrid work. Oh, that's good. I'll do that on Monday. Yeah. Um, great resignation. I'll do that on Tuesday. Reskilling. I'll do it Wednesday. Oh, how do you simplify that complex world? Talent, mm-hmm. organization, leadership, and that's what we're doing. Yeah. Which one of the other? Which are, I don't want to kind of go over every single one of the ten ideas. Which were one of the ideas that kind of stood out to you the most? Um, you know what I love to think about talent, organization, leadership, that's the evolution An organization is creating a culture and culture is hot on LinkedIn. And you see it posted everybody. I want to create a culture. And by the way, there's evolutions, there's stages. Um, Ooh, I should show a picture. This is in the paper so you can get it. I've got pictures so that I can show pictures. By the way, I am horrible with artwork. I've had four or five people say, hire someone to put your ideas in artwork. And I've gone, Look at the ideas, and if you need good artwork, wait for a while. Somebody will do it. Culture, yeah, I'd love you. But by the way, a lot of people talk about culture as values. That's our fundamental values, uh, and every company's got them, that lead to behavior. Then you have culture as a set of systems, the systems, the process. Then you have culture as norms and patterns. Where we want to go is culture outside in. Now it's not just about a culture. Are your values creating value for your customer? By the way, if your values don't create value for your customer, if your culture isn't creating value for your customer, why do you have it? Why do you have it? So here's the diagnostic question. Every by the way, Chris, I'm so excited. I, and I've got to get it all in because I won't talk to you again for five years. So, uh, (laughs) and I'm making a joke about that. Um, I just, this stuff is so exciting. Every company has got a value set. Mm -hmm. Go to your customers, ask them three questions. Number one, are these the values you want us to be known for? Innovation, sure. Collaboration, sure. Integrity, oh, absolutely. Got it. Question two. By the way, sometimes you fail on question one. I was with a company a few years ago. One of their values was, we want to be the most profitable firm in our industry. So imagine, Chris, if somebody came to you and said, We want to be the most profitable firm in our industry. Can we work with you? No, no, because you're going to charge me more every time you can. But we like innovation, collaboration. Question two, what do we have to do in our company to show you that we live collaboration, innovation that meets your needs better than our competitor? Let the customer define the behavior. Number three, when we do that, Will you buy more from us? Ah, by the way, when I work with senior line, I, I spend about half my time with business leaders. When I work with them, they they oh, here comes culture again. And I say, let me take you through the three questions. Or these are right value. They go, oh, that's fine. What are the behaviors? Oh, that's interesting. Will you buy more from us? They say, say that again. Because <laughs> that's what we're interested in. Exactly. We want to build a culture that causes you to buy more from us. By the way, that moves culture forward. It doesn't suggest that what we've done is wrong. That's what I love about these kind of pictures. Values, they're so critical. Systems, critical. Patterns, critical. Now let's go to the next step and build on what we've done. I think that's really helpful for HR people to work with business leaders. I agree. Three great questions there. Make sure you go and ask them, everyone listening. Um, Number six on on your list kind of stood out to me. You said enhance leadership. Leaders at all levels make others feel better about themselves. What do you what do you mean Uh, by that? Let me let me get the uh, I love simplicity. I've I've studied leadership. We do notice I just said we did a data set with or guidance system with a thousand companies. We did the uh, 
machine learning, this new project. We've got G3 governance and guidance for growth through human capability with 7,000 companies. But I love really simple ideas. And here's the simplest idea I can find. Do people leave their interaction with you as a leader feeling better or worse about themselves? And some people say, well, where's the data? I said, leadership isn't just about data. We can go, we do statistics. Chris, I'm going to say, I've had interactions with you over the years, not just five years. I remember an interaction with you. I was sitting in my car. I know where I was when you talked about starting this show because you'd worked at this other company I won't name. We had worked together. You are such a great partner. And you were saying, should I start this show? And I said, Chris, you are so good. You have so many ideas. You bring out the best in others. By the way, Chris, over the 10, that was probably eight, 10 years ago, over the 10 years we've worked together, I never leave an interaction with you without feeling better about myself. Chester Elton, oh, I can yeah. never leave an interaction <laughs> not feeling better about myself. And I could call out a dozen people. Yeah. You know what? That's my test of leadership. Mm. Yeah. It's so simple, but so important, yeah. right? It is. And, and, and that's easy and good news. Chris, you're really successful. That's fine. But what if somebody's got bad news? Mm. Let me give an anchor because I think that may be helpful for your readers. I'm coaching a leader, doesn't matter where, big company, senior leader, not in HR. An employee made a mistake, big mistake. It's going to cost a lot of money. I had coached this leader to talk to me first, happened to do through email because the world we were in, before the leader responded to their employees. And here was the email the leader prepared. Bad on email, should be face-to-face -face or, or verbal. You made a huge mistake that's going to cost us millions of dollars. If you can't fix that and get better, you're fired. Whoa. I said, I'm going to intervene. Three interventions. By the way, the goal is to make sure the employee feels better about himself, even though the employee made a mistake. Intervention number one, I care about you. That's pretty simple. Number two, you have great potential at this company. Then you made a mistake. It's going to cost us millions of dollars. Do not hide as a leader from the, from, you made a mistake. It's going to cost us money. Then intervention three, how do we learn from the mistake so that you can get better? So instead of it threatening, you're going to get fired. By the way, look at those three simple words. I care. You have potential. You made a mistake. By the way, you've got a beautiful daughter. I bet there are some things she doesn't do perfectly. <laughs> and so what do you do as a parent? Yeah. I care about you. Yeah. I envision you as a future being better than me. I hope every child, every parent wants their child to be better. You made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Let's get better. By the way, that's the message in a very pragmatic way of what leadership is about. Then you say, what are the skills for doing it? Okay, okay. we can get into all kinds of details. Yeah. You've got to set a direction. You've got to actually, you've got to get things done. You've got to work with your people. By the way, one of those skills that I am getting more convinced about than ever in the middle of our leadership code framework is personal proficiency. Mm -hmm. I am finding that one of the keys right now for leaders to help others feel better about themselves is take care of yourself first. Yeah. When I coach leaders and Chris, if I ever had the privilege of coaching you, I'd end every session with the question, what are you doing to take care of yourself? Yeah. What are you doing to take care of yourself? I should have my notes. I asked that yesterday of this group we were with in person. I got great answers. Some yeah. of it is physical exercise, nutrition, sleep. Some of it is social. Some of it was one of the comments yesterday. And I'm going to think about this and maybe post it was I've got to find, I've got to give myself space. Yeah. I've got to give myself space physically, emotionally, socially. I've just got to find space. I thought that's really interesting. So Chris, I'm going to ask you, you knew I'd ask, <laughs> what do you do? Chris, you've had some good things and bad things happen. And I don't want to get into that. Sure. What do you do to take care of yourself? Sure. Firstly, um, Ch Chester Elton is my coach, Dave. I'm not sure if you knew that, um, but, but, but he asks me that very often. And I'll be honest, and my team's listening right now. I don't do the greatest job of doing that, to be honest. And I... I he told me to raise this with you today. <laughs> no, that's the, that's that. the whole reason we're doing this live show. Dave, yeah. you, you snuck it in there. Um, you mentioned space for me. That's definitely one. I, I realized that I need my own space and I find that in the gym in, in my own space. Right. Um, it kind of the three things you mentioned, sleep well, eat well, and exercise. If I'm doing those things 
everything else seems to be better. I can be a better dad, a better husband, a better leader, a better friend. Um, you know, uh, so it starts there, but I'll be lying if I said I always, <laughs> well, and, I always, and, always good I, at that. I, yeah, I, I hope every, by the way, one of the trends out of the last two years is personalization. Mm -hmm. We used to talk about flexible work policies, flexible workforce, multi-generation. You got to be on flexible. It's really personalized. And so, Chris, what works for you to create space and what works for me may be different. I yeah. have a friend who loves to exercise. And he said, Dave, you need to exercise. And I looked at him and said, I am so glad that works for you. <laughs> uh, yeah. By the way, I've tried to manage those things. I think we've also got to do stuff that may be just weird and fun for us. In the 90s, and I'm going to now make a confession, when I get stressed and we all have emotional funk, I po posted on that last week, I used to watch a TV show in the U.S. called Seinfeld. Yeah, I, I'm sure the UK's got a version of it as well. We, we watch Seinfeld, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a stupid television show. It, it's a show about nothing. But when I need a break, watch Seinfeld. And and I hope, Chris, you have things. And it may be going for a walk with your daughter. It may be taking a weekend with your spouse. It may be whatever it is. Find a <laughs> By the way, I'll confess what I do now. We live in a, not in the, in a nice house. I go sit outside in the sun. Boy, I have not confessed this. I'm now announcing a new product and I'm, I'm making a confession. I sit out in the sun and read a novel for an hour. And my wife said, Dave, what are you doing? I said, I just need an hour. I'm going to read some escape novel. It's not salacious, but it's just, I'm going to go sit in the sun and read a novel. And she said, it's not going to make you look a lot better. And I said, that's not the purpose. <laughs> I just... Chris, I really encourage you to find the space that works for you. Yeah, and and everyone listening, what yeah. would work for you? One of my other one, one of my other ones is is video games. <laughs> it's it's like a, escaping into a different world and just turning off for a second, and uh, yeah, just getting away from it is so important. It's so By important. the way, my wife's a very good psychologist. She uh, she has found in the research that video games release endorphins. They release mental things that really give you a sense of success. They're also dangerous, by the way, because some people who get addicted, not you, expect that same level of endorphins in work. And we may not always ah, have it. We may not always have that same level. But but video games, music, going on a drive. Yesterday, mm -hmm. okay, I'm, I'm really opening up. We live in the United States and it's fall for us as it is in the UK. We live in the mountains. We drove for 45 minutes, what's called the Alpine Loop, where there's 20 miles of aspen trees. Wow. And they were spectacular. The colors were at their peak. So from three to four in the middle of a very demanding day, Wendy and I looked at each other and said, let's go for a drive. Mm -hmm. And we came back at four. We found space. Oh, do I hope people can find a way to do that. And by the way, let's go the other side. If you're co if, if you get El Chester Elton as your coach, by the way, you win big time. Chester is the best there is. If you and listening to this are a coach, license people to find their space. License people to find their space, wherever it may be. One quick anecdote. I'm coaching a business leader, CEO of a company, so he has tons of money. I would never coach others to do this. I'm going and he's discouraged. What's going on? Oh, I'm feeling a little down today. How come? I have a 15-year-old son and he and I are in a little bit of conflict. And I said, wow, that's never happened before. And he said, really? And I said, what are you talking about? A 15-year-old son always has conflict with his father. That's inevitable. I said, tell me about your son. He said, I picked this because of the season. He said, oh, he's a good boy. He loves baseball. By the way, I was going to say why, but that's I didn't say that. How much does he, oh, he loves baseball. Who's his favorite team? The New York Yankees. Same season now. And I said, you know, the Yankees are in the World Series. And he said, oh, I guess that's true. And they're at home tomorrow night. And he said, yeah, I guess that's true. And I looked at him and I said, go. And he said, I don't have a ticket. By the way, that's the stupidest thing a leader has ever said to me. This is a CEO <laughs> making millions of dollars a year. I don't have a ticket. That's hilarious. By the way, I then did say to him, your son is right. You are a terrible father. <laughs> that's such a dorky thing. Go buy a ticket. Yeah. It's going to cost you. I don't care what it costs. Throw out a number, two thousand, five thousand dollars, and don't get a bad ticket. Get a great ticket, and call your son and say, "I'm taking you out of school. We're going to get a car. We're going to go to the game early. We're going to eat hot dogs. We're going to get sick. We're going to go to the Yankees." 
three days later, he called me back and he said, Dave, thank you. You reminded me. Again, we just use the term space. Mm. That's a memory my son and I will always have. Boy, do I hope we can coach ourselves. Take care of yourself so you can take care of others. That's a tagline. Yes. I hope we can coach ourselves and others to take yeah. care. I got you know, carried away on that, Chris. That's now, the personal right. stuff. I, 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 I'm, sometimes I'm so focused on chasing the next goal or the next win that I forget that why am I doing this anyway in the first place? And if, if, it's, if it's not to spend time with the people that I love, like my daughter and Natasha and my friends. And then why am I doing it? And so, sometimes and, we forget about that. And you know, Chris, I should just, we should high five. That's an American symbol of high five. <laughs> high five. Uh, we agree. I also am guilty of that. I'm boy, this is, I'm going to have to pay you as a therapist for this show. <laughs> I, I love my work. My ideas are my friends. I I'm inventing. I'm trying to co-create. I just, those 10 inventions, those 10 evolutions, you can find them online. My wife has to remind me once in a while, Dave, stop. So that what? So, so that, that what? So that yeah. what, yeah. And uh, so I think all of us who are ambitious, again, there's nothing wrong with being driven. I mean, then I don't think there's shame in that. I'm not ashamed of that. And by the way, sometimes my so that is LinkedIn. Mm. I love getting on LinkedIn. I also love connecting with people um, and find a way to connect around whatever it is that we connect with. Yeah. Great place on that in the comment section and if everyone listening the link to the article is in the chat so wherever you are right now the link to that the the, the uh, what we're talking about is in the chat yeah, a lot of people added their own ideas dave what was one of the ones that stood out to you that you that you thought was pretty pretty insightful I did that a few months ago one of the ideas that i think is standing out is how do we use technology and digital to reinvent work and and i think we're seeing some of that with hybrid by the way, the issue for me with technology, and I don't have it fully in my head yet, and it was one of those that, that kind of stood out, is hybrid work is less about where you work and how you work. You can be in your home office. I can be in my office. That's where we work. We're connected through technology. The real issue of hybrid is not where and how, but what and why. What are you and I doing today that will create value for someone else? And I think sometimes in hybrid work, and people refer to that in technology, we get so locked in to what's the latest technology. And by the way, I am so out of date. My wife and I teach a course of college students nearby. We taught last night. And uh, two quick anecdotes. One, I said, if you have a question, send me an email. And they said, how old are you? Uh, and the other, they said, we are now connecting on Slack, S-L-A-C-K. I don't have a clue what it is. I mean, I'm still working through Instagram and Twitter and I've, I've passed and Facebook, I, but we've got to use technology to build relationships. We've got to find a way to use technology to connect. I'm not sure yet how to do that. And I think that's one of the issues I'm thinking about. So hybrid work is not about where and how it's about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And if we, if our show today, Chris, gives somebody an idea that will help them, the fact that you're in your home, in your studio home office, I'm in my home, Shane is, we don't know where he is, Ivan's in some uh, video game right now, playing video games, or, or guitar, if I remember Ivan's history, we don't care as long as we're creating value for someone else. That's the issue. I asked you this question five years ago. I'm going to ask you it again. What does keep you going? How are you, what, what keeps you going? How are you always disrupting Dave? You know, I think we've all been through value clarification exercises. I think we constantly do that. Um, I ended our session yesterday with the question, what is the identity that drives you that you hope creates value? I've, I've done that. I, I mean, and there's lots of things that keep us going. Our family, our friends, the mentors we have. When I look at, for me, and I hope, Chris, I'll ask you the same since you asked me what keeps mm -hmm. me going. Sure. Uh, mine is two things, and I've been willing to boil them down because I've thought about that. I love to learn. So whenever you see me with a paper, it's almost like, <laughs> what am I learning? What's the evolution? I printed these because they're on the thing. <laughs> What's the evolution? And by the way, this shows how old I am because I still use paper. What's the evolution? Yeah. I love to learn. That's one. Um, and so, by the way, you see me getting frustrated once in a while on LinkedIn when I see people reinventing the past. 
Mm-hmm. I'm not as interested at reinventing what we've done. I want to I want to create what the future says. The second one for me, learning that will create value for someone else. Mm. If an idea doesn't create value for someone else, I'm not sure it's a great idea. That's leadership. Did your brand? Well, I'll give you an example. I'm coaching another phenomenal leader. Born in the Philippines in a hut. Couldn't read. Uh, couldn't write, went to school at age six, sat in the back of the room. Very fast story. 10 years later, top student in the Philippines, went to a U.S. school, valedictorian of a college, went to Harvard for PhD, speaks six languages, also got a graduate degree at MIT, uh, worked in the Russian embassy, ran Microsoft Asia. I mean, one of these leaders rags to riches that, boy, if you ever want someone on your show, Chris, she's so good. She became a few years ago the president of the local university with 40,000 students. Still relatively young, energetic, brilliant, brilliant lady. Everybody wants her to tell her story because she's got a great brand. Rags to riches, an incredible story. When I coached her, I said, quit telling your story. And she said, I like my story. You should like your story. It's great. But your job as a leader is to help other people create their story. And their story is not yours. I mean, nobody's going to, I mean, she's one of those people that we all just sit in awe of. So when you sit with a student, don't just share your success. Say, tell me about you. We went and sat with a student. He was in raggedy jeans, a raggedy top, and he didn't know who we were. He, she was relatively new. We said, tell us about you. He said, I'm at this school learning to be an airline mechanic. I'm the first student in my family who will graduate from college. And my family's so proud of me. And then she said, what can we as a school do to help you create that story? By the way, Chris, that's the agenda for me. Am I learning in a way that helps others create their story? Do I want people to leave their interaction with me feeling better about themselves? And I mistake that. I sometimes get pissy. Pissy is probably not a very good word. I get snarky (laughs) because I get frustrated. I especially get frustrated when people don't want to learn. Learn grow, build on each other. Look Mm -hmm. at what's right. Anyway, that's, those are my, what are yours? What are you driven by? And I know we're running out of time. fast. It's it's kind of, it's it's changed over the years, depending on how life circumstances early on, it was really just to provide a better life for my family. And, you know, I grew up, as you know, with a single parent, four kids and on benefits and very poor. So the first maybe five years of my career was about how do I create a better life and for future generations of the rainies. <laughs> uh, and uh, and I, I accidentally fell into this world of HR as, as a sales executive at 17. I never went to school. And I, I'll be lying if I said I got into HR because I loved HR. I think most people will be lying if they said that they grew up wanting to be in HR. Um, <laughs> uh, but along the way, I fell in love with it because I, I, so firstly, I'd say I'm in it to want to create a better life for Robin, the, her generation and the rainy's that for the rainy generation moving forward and then secondly the work that we do that you do and the conversations i have on the podcast the events the summits it it changes and impacts the lives of millions of employees all around the world not just the employees actually their families society and that is pretty incredible you know speaking to CHROs of global brands who have implemented ideas based on our content that have now been rolled out to 100,000 people in their business, that's a good reason to get out of bed every day, you know? Oh, I, I so the group we had the last two days in person, we went around 700,000 employees. Mm, I just wow. did a webinar before this session. And he said, I looked at the people who've registered. They represent 2 million employees. Yeah. Ah, you and I did some work and and thanks to, to others who joined us with those in Ukraine. Mm. Yes. Five million refugees. Chris, thank you for helping with that. Mm-hmm. We talked to Yuliana. We talked to the Ukrainian HR people. And I think 20, 30 million people in Ukraine are going to be impacted because of what we do. And directly, five million refugees, mostly women, who had to leave the country. Chris, we do make a difference. That's Somebody said, we don't have a job. In some ways, we have a calling. Mm. And I, I sense that in you. That's partly why I'm so drawn to, to you. You too, Dave. Well, listen, I know I've got to let you go at some point. Um, where can people, uh, oh, firstly, if you're listening on LinkedIn now, if you're not already following Dave, go and follow Dave. 
as 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 he mentioned, he posts every single month, which is incredible. Week so every week. Oh, oh, sorry, Tuesday. week every Tuesday, every, which is which is which is amazing. So make sure you do that, and uh, you can see. By the way, the next post is fun. Next Tuesday, I'm going to post on the ten criteria of analytics for analytics. Oh wow, analytics okay. is booming. Yes. Everybody's into analytics. 100%. By the way, if you want to increase your salary in HR, just put analytics behind your title. I do staffing for analytics. I do development for analytics. Yeah. So I worked at that and I said, I think there are 10 criteria for the analytics of analytics. So anyway, I cut you off. No, no worries. No worries. And there's also another link in the description as well to the article around establishing the organizational guidance system. So make sure you click that in the comments and apart from that also if you're new on linkedin or if you don't know this yet the new update there's a little bell icon so on dave's profile on my profile there's a little bell there if you click that bell it will notify you via email whenever we post whenever they post whenever i post so make sure you click that function but apart from that wherever you are in the world enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you again soon but thank you so much it's always a pleasure dave thank you thank you the best of you